Κατάλληλο. Επιθυμητή εικονική συνένεση. There is only one time when history is not historic. And that is when it is being made. Humorist Will Rogers called her the only beauty who went through history and retained her reputation. For half a millennium, she has been adored, revered, coveted, copied, and analyzed. Still, her intentions remain cloaked in an aura of secrecy, hidden behind an inscrutable smile and piercing eyes. That veil of mystery has frustrated scores of researchers and historians. But with each generation, the quest for answers has been renewed. Can 21st century scientists succeed where so many others have failed? Will 3D image scanning uncover new details about technique and materials? Can emotion recognition software decipher the meaning of that magical smile? This is the story of one of the world's great paintings, an enduring masterpiece that has captivated and inspired imaginations for some 500 years. The Secrets of Mona Lisa, next on How It Was. On July 15, 1542, the convent of St. Ursula in Florence, Italy, recorded the passing of perhaps their most celebrated resident. She was the mother of one of the nuns, Sister Ludovica. She died at the age of 63 after a long illness. The old woman was well known in Florence, and the entire parish attended her funeral. Her name was Lisa Gerardini. By most accounts, Lisa had sat for a portrait some 40 years earlier, when she was around 25. The artist was Leonardo da Vinci. We know the painting as the Mona Lisa. Today, 8 million visitors a year file through her home, the Musée de Louvre in Paris. Most line up for a glimpse of the portrait, which is kept behind crowd control barriers and bulletproof glass. It is perhaps the best known painting in the world. But how did Leonardo give Mona Lisa the power to enchant her millions of visitors? What can the raw evidence, the painting itself, tell us about Lisa Gerardini and Leonardo? The promise of answering such questions prompts every generation to try out its newest inventions on the painting. Louvre curators are no different. In 2004, they launched an ambitious high-tech investigation. The purpose was to assess the Mona Lisa's rate of deterioration and create a precise baseline for future preservation efforts. The compiled data also provided a deeper understanding of Leonardo's process, his preparation of the panel, his choice of pigments, his lack of experience with oils, Along the way, Mona yielded a few of her more ethereal secrets, quite by accident. The investigation begins after hours. The museum is tense with anticipation. Mona Lisa is leaving her bulletproof cell. She's due for her most thorough health check in 500 years a process documented in this series of photographs. Under the watchful eyes of curators and scientists, the Mona Lisa moves to a conservation lab beneath the Louvre. During the course of three 36-hour sessions, the painting is weighed, measured, photographed, x-rayed, and scanned. It is the most comprehensive test of an artwork in human history. We were asked uh, to study the painting for one main reason. Uh, the main reason is uh, the stability of the, uh, the panel. The painting is not painted on canvas, but on panel. The concern that Louvre had was the effect of temperatures and humidity and the warping. It's a wood panel, and therefore it's a, it has a lot of distortion associated with it. 
And by using this technology, we're hoping to be able to record the exact shape so that they can study the physical behavior of the painting. Is the painting deteriorating? Besides assessing the painting's physical condition, the high-tech regimen helped Mona Lisa tell her story. Space Age devices gave voice to the evidence embedded in Leonardo's materials and methods. The data required more than a year to process, but as the results took shape, the team of art historians and curators posed an extraordinary and controversial question. Was the Mona Lisa a portrait of a pregnant woman? One of the tests was a photographic process called infrared reflectography. The science is complex, but it boils down to this. An infrared camera can photograph details we can't see. When the camera peered through the painting's darkened varnish, it detected something unusual about Mona's attire. According to Bruno Motte, one of the curators who organized the testing, the model seemed to be enveloped by a transparent gauze-like veil. I could observe that there was gauze on the left arm, there was also gauze on the right arm, and uh, the, the model seems to be totally enveloped in a transparent gauze. So I deduced that uh, the model was uh, totally enveloped by uh, a sort of um, a second dress. The discovery led to new speculation. Some historians believe this second dress may be a guarnello, a garment thought to be worn by pregnant women or new mothers. This painting by Sandro Botticelli, a contemporary of Leonardo, depicts a woman wearing a guarnello. And that woman in the Botticelli painting is pregnant. If Mona Lisa's veil is indeed a guarnello, it suggests that the painting alludes to some aspect of motherhood. Some have even wondered if Mona herself might be pregnant. Leonardo's depiction of Mona Lisa's hands may support this provocative theory. One scholar, a medical doctor, sees her hands as swollen or puffy, a typical sign of pregnancy. Others, however, insist that Lisa's hands are shaped by Renaissance ideals of beauty and nothing more. The Renaissance seems to admire large female hands, and there's a treatise by a guy called Firenzuolo from the middle of the 16th century in which he talks about these large hands and long fingers that were desirable. So large hands was in, and if you look at the hands, for instance, of Leonardo's Cecilia Gallerani, you see that they're huge. And though the Botticelli work shows a woman who is both pregnant and wearing a guarnello, the connection between them is disputed. We have absolutely no evidence that I know of, no one's done the research to state that the guanella was written, was worn by pregnant women. What little we know about the historical Lisa Gerardini is found in a handful of old documents. These few shreds of evidence do shine some light on the mystery of the guarnello. This baptismal certificate tells us Lisa Gerardini was born in Florence on June 15, 1479. A marriage contract confirms that by the age of 16, she'd married Francesco del Giocondo, a wealthy cloth merchant. At the time, women of Lisa's position were addressed as Mona, short for Madonna, and roughly equivalent to My Lady. Lisa Gerardini was Mona Lisa long before there was a painting of that name. Lisa and Francesco had five children. Their second son was born in December of 1502. Many sources say Leonardo began the portrait around 1503. So the recent birth of her child may explain why Lisa is wearing a guarnello. The presence of the guarnello told us that uh, this painting was probably commissioned by um, Francesco del Giorgondo to celebrate the birth of the second boy of Mona Lisa. Though the image of Madonna and child was widely celebrated, some historians dispute that an ordinary birth like Mona Lisa's second son would have warranted a painting. Pregnancy was really not something to celebrate in the sense that we celebrate it today. Women would have 15, 20 children in the course of their uh, childbearing life. Um, you know, these would die childbirth in, in, in quite soon after they were born. There would be stillborn. 
And don't forget, too, that women would die continually in childbirth. And most women would make up their wills before the arrival of the baby because it was a moot point whether they would survive it. The portrait of Lisa Gerardini is often called La Gioconda, a reference to her husband's name. Yet inexplicably, Leonardo, not Francesco del Giocondo, ended up with the painting. That discrepancy doesn't bother some scholars. They don't even believe Lisa Gerardini was Leonardo's model. Others dispute when the painting was done or claim that part of it is actually missing. Over the years, the Mona Lisa has resisted most attempts to unravel her mysteries. Now, computer technology takes its turn at the painting, starting from the bare wood panel and working up to that eternally provocative smile. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, main in, start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis to assemble the framework for the science laboratories of tomorrow. When the Space Shuttle Atlantis lifted off for its 27th mission, one of the most accurate 3D scanners on the planet went up with it. SRB separation is confirmed two minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. Engineered by Canada's National Research Council, or NRC, the scanner records details smaller than a human hair. In outer space, it would look for problems on the shuttle's heat tiles. Here on Earth, NRC scientists originally designed the 3D technology for documenting artworks. For example, they made scans to capture the fine tool marks Michelangelo left on his statue of David. When Louvre officials undertook the testing of Mona Lisa in 2004, NRC was asked to scan the painting as part of the checkup. For the NRC team, coming face to face with Mona Lisa was a bit disconcerting. When you're closer, you really see that it has this different texture, that transparency that really add to the experience. We had a little time to really enjoy the art aspect uh, of the of the whole operation but it is it is much nicer up close than what we get in magazines and posters and everything the nrc team scanned the front and back of the mona lisa in 108 small sections scanning all four sides added more pieces to the puzzle missing even one would leave a gaping hole in the 3d model as they're acquiring the data in the next room, I was assembling all the different patches in another room, making sure that we didn't forget anything. We did actually forget one little strip towards the bottom, so I had to tell them, you know, hey, wait, wait, guys, go back, get these three images, and I assembled them. So it was good that I was here. When NRC's team of scientists left Paris, they took with them roughly nine gigabytes of data, the 3D model of the Mona Lisa. We invited ourselves to the NRC lab in Ottawa, Canada, to see how they processed that information. The scan is made out of uh, 72 images for the front section. Michel Picard explained how he pieced the sections together electronically. We bring them in one by one and assemble them together. So here I'm going to bring in a second image. You can see that it's out of alignment. Each section had been scanned so that its edges overlapped the sections near it. I zoom in to find common points. The first task in joining two sections is selecting points in common on the overlapping edges. So with the three common points, you snap the images together and you have a rough alignment. The software then figures out exactly how much to adjust the rough alignment to achieve an exact match. And then you have perfect registration and it's like it was one image. However, that one image, front, back and sides, was such a massive set of data, it threatened to crash any normal computer that dared to open it. The way we solve that problem is to send only the part of the data set that is 
truly visible and required to produce this image, as I go in like this, let's say on the smile, I only need a smaller and smaller part of the painting. However, I need it at a higher resolution. Louise Bourget created software that continuously decides which data and how much of it is needed to display the changing image. When the image is rotated, the software realizes it doesn't need data from the front of the image, so it phases that out while turning its attention to data for the side and back. The end result is a perfect 3D model of the painting, viewable from any angle under varied lighting conditions. One thing we can, we can do also is use representations that take the data, don't change it, but represent it differently, express it differently by using ma mathematical transformations to show things that are not as easily visible uh, using that virtual lighting. Here, what we do is use a technique that highlight small shape variation in the painting surface. There is no color. This is just information from the shape. And what we see very easily is the wood grain. You have the, the center of the tree here in the middle. And then on each side, you have all the, the wood grain, uh, the vertical lines that correspond to every year of growth of the tree here and here. And we can see the symmetry since it's taken from the center of the tree vertically. And this is much more difficult to see just looking at the, the piece itself, the original painting. Those familiar with the Mona Lisa from books and posters may never have imagined it was painted on a plank of wood, complete with insect holes and gouges from the teeth of a handsaw. For curators and art historians, the panel is a starting point for understanding Leonardo, his materials, and his methods. Leonardo used poplar for this particular painting. It's not the best kind of wood to use. It's a bit porous and it's subject to infestations by insects, but it's uh, a wood that grows in the area and so it's commonly used. Regardless of the wood variety, carpentry tools of Leonardo's time left most panels with a rough surface. And for painting, you want a really smooth, nice surface. So the preparation that was used is a mixture of chalk or gypsum or alabaster, some kind of white inert filling that will give substance and make a sort of a plaster. And it's mixed with an animal hide glue. The mix of hide glue and chalk or gypsum is called gesso. When used on a panel, it's known as the ground. Although this process was well known even in Leonardo's day, Supplies for making the ground are still available. This is a piece of poplar, which is the same wood that the Mona Lisa is painted on. The first step would be to apply a layer of hide glue, which is known as size, to the panel. That's a very simple procedure, but it's important because it's going to cause the uh, rest of the ingredients to adhere properly to the panel. The glue, or sizing, is brushed onto the panel surface. After it has dried overnight, the first layer of gesso is applied by brush, then manually worked into the wood. If the gesso is not rubbed in, you sometimes get little pockets where it doesn't adhere, and that will later appear as a bubble or an air hole in the panel, and that will be a defect that will show through all the way to the top layer of the paint. Six to eight thin coats of gesso are brushed over the first layer. Once the panel is dry, the surface is scraped smooth. The ground for a typical oil painting would end up about a half a millimeter deep, less than one thirty-second of an inch. The finished panel for the Mona Lisa would have had a polished surface like this one. Whether Leonardo or a professional panel maker prepared it is yet another secret Mona Lisa has kept to herself. The panel's preparation, however, provides evidence that resolves at least one Mona Lisa controversy. Early copies of the painting, like this one from the 1600s, show distinct columns on either side of Mona Lisa. But just a hint of columns can be found on the original. The disparity has fueled speculation that the Mona Lisa was trimmed and most of the columns lost. The clues lie here, in this strip of wood at the edge of the panel. Known as the wood reserve, it tells us that a frame was on the panel when the ground was applied. As the gesso was brushed on, and later when Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa, pigment accumulated against the frame.
And over the years, the painting lost the original frame. And when the frame came away, that little ridge is left. And because the ridge is intact all the way around the painting, we know that the Mona Lisa has not been cut down from a larger image, that we have the entire painting and that it's intact. Few of the mysteries that surround this work can be resolved so neatly. From Leonardo's brushwork to the meaning of Mona Lisa's wild landscape, this painting has tantalized the art world for some 500 years. But now, thanks to 21st century technology, the veil has finally begun to lift on this 16th century masterpiece. Viewed up close, the Mona Lisa resembles a geologic rift zone. Much of the cracking, or crack lore as curators call it, is an artifact of Mona Lisa's venerable age. But some of Leonardo's own actions may have made the problem worse. Before using any colors, Leonardo would have applied the priming, a layer of white pasty oil paint directly onto the gesso ground. The gesso, even though it's very smooth, it's extremely absorbent. For oil painting, though, this can be a problem because the chalk or the gypsum in the gesso will suck the oil right out of the oil paint. Priming prevented that absorption. After the priming had dried for a week or more, Leonardo could begin his work. Art historians believe Leonardo created an underdrawing to provide form and composition. Then he carefully built up his masterpiece layer by layer. In such a complex process, painters had to observe a principle known as fat over lean. Each new layer of paint had to be mixed with more oil than the one before it. If not, the underlayer could dry more rapidly and crack. When he began the Mona Lisa, Leonardo was still learning about oil paint. Curators suspect that cracks developed during Leonardo's lifetime, perhaps because he broke the rule of fat over lean. The uppermost layers were extremely thin mixes of paint known as glazes. One of these is a dark glaze called sfumato, meaning smoky. It gives the Mona Lisa much of her mysterious air. The sfumato, the feeling of the figure coming out of the darkness, out of a kind of a smoky veil, is really unique to Leonardo. And I think it's the one aspect of the painting that people really see as different from other paintings. Art historians always assumed that Leonardo used conventional pigments for sfumato and the Mona Lisa's many layers of color. But proving it would have required taking a sample of the paint itself. Samples for scientific testing have been clipped from other Leonardo paintings and even from the Shroud of Turin. But the Mona Lisa is sacred and inviolate. Sampling was not an option. In recent years, however, new equipment and techniques were developed that could coax answers from Mona Lisa without violating her. Among these were two different procedures, Raymond spectrometry and X-ray fluorescence that beamed signals at the painting. Different pigments reacted to or reflected the beams in distinct, identifiable ways, signaling their presence. Among other findings, X-ray fluorescence turned up traces of a red glaze made from insects. Leonardo seems to have used this in the flesh tones. It's a fugitive color, that is, it fades over time, so it's hard to identify it now. And because he used color that faded, the pink quality of the flesh tones has probably somewhat disappeared over time. Insects are still a source for red pigment today. But the Mediterranean species from Leonardo's era has been replaced by cochineal, a New World variety that makes its home on cactus. After the discovery of the Americas and trade began, the Spaniards used to bring a very similar insect over, and it became a high trade item, and it eventually replaced the original in painting. And a dye was made from these insects. The dye was used for fabrics, and then in order to make it into a pigment for paint, using lye, the dye would be re-extracted from the fabric, and then it would be precipitated using alum into a powder. 
that powder can then be made into a paint and artists would get the pigment as a powder and they would make it into paint and then use it to modify the paints that they were already using. The Louvre testing also confirmed Leonardo's use of the most prized Renaissance pigment of them all, lapis. Its significance went beyond the beauty of the color in that it was the most expensive of the pigments that artists were using in the panel painting. The expense came not only from the rarity of the pigment, it came from Afghanistan and from one particular location in Afghanistan, but also because it's extremely labor intensive to get the blue out of the stone. The process required resin, lye, wax, and oil, as well as heating, mixing, and kneading then waiting as long as two weeks for the color to separate out. And there was something else. From a great deal of pulverized stone, just a little bit of blue pigment would be extracted. As you write, a much cheaper blue pigment was easier to prepare. Grind the stone into a fine powder, add oil, and start painting. But even though as you write was affordable, lapis was preferred. When Leonardo painted the sky area of the Mona Lisa, he underpainted it first with the less expensive azurite, and then allowed that to dry and applied the lapis as a second layer on top of the azurite. This was a common technique at the time that would allow for the look of the lapis without making it as expensive. So why is the lapis blue sky so dull? There's nothing wrong with your screen. It is yellowing varnish applied by curators years ago that hides the Mona Lisa's colors. No one knows exactly what the painting looked like in its heyday. This rendering gives a sense of the original. Still, the testing in 2004 confirmed Leonardo did use typical Renaissance pigments to paint the Mona Lisa. But color only tells part of the story. Among the innovations Leonardo brought to the portrait of Lisa Gerardini was her pose. The pose of the Mona Lisa is really revolutionary. There's no previous portrait has this amount of motion in it. Leonardo is experimenting with the female body as flexible and as mobile, uh, which hadn't been done before. Her legs are parallel to the picture plane, facing left. And her torso has moved around by about 90 degrees so that she almost faces the viewer. And her head is actually facing the viewer, but her eyes are over towards the viewer's right. Beneath the painting surface lies evidence of Leonardo's willingness to experiment. In the finished painting, Mona Lisa's left hand appears relaxed. Yet an infrared image reveals that Leonardo initially had Mona Lisa grip the chair. For some reason, he changed the hand. We have to only to guess, but I, I think that um, he wanted to stabilize the, the, the lower part of the painting. He wanted to, to give a more uh, uh, relaxed attitude to the model. The top part in movement and the lower part stable. An X-ray process known as emesiography reveals that Mona Lisa's left hand is well-defined beneath her right. Some scholars see this as evidence. Leonardo may have initially intended the left hand to be seen. However Leonardo decided on the pose, it seems to have had a practical application. Portraits of that era were generally displayed in or near the bedchamber, the camara. He would have known that it would have been in this room that in every household was decorated, which is also the place where they receive their guests. The concept of a bedroom was quite different in the Renaissance than it is now. The bed was a very expensive piece of furniture and you, you wanted to make sure people saw it. Before Leonardo's creative leap, visitors entering the Camaro would see a portrait simply as an object on display. But the Mona Lisa was designed to be interactive. The conceit is that the Mona Lisa is surprised by the visitor who's come into her camera. She's turning around and greeting him with an amiable expression. Though it may have been custom made for the residents of Francesco del Giocondo, the Mona Lisa was apparently never delivered. Some have speculated that Leonardo loved the work so much 
he couldn't bear to part with it. But there may be another explanation. An appearance of wealth and magnificence and splendor was very, very important in Renaissance Italy. This was where capitalism started, after all, and we can appreciate the values. Their values were very like ours. The greater the wealth, the better. Most of the portraits throughout the second half of the 15th century show the women very heavily laden with rich brocades and with lots of jewelry. And the Mona Lisa has very little of this. This may be one reason why he kept the work. It may just have been refused by the patron because it made her look, by their standards, it made her look poverty-stricken. Humbly clothed and bereft of jewels, Mona Lisa remained with Leonardo. She traveled with him for more than a decade and ended up in France, where Leonardo died in 1519. With Leonardo's death, a new era began. Mona Lisa was on her own. Her adventures and perils would elevate her from being Leonardo's best-known painting to one of the most famous works of art ever created. Imagine what would happen if it happened today. Outrage and grief, bitter accusations and official denials, a global manhunt, and cries for retribution. Imagine just for a moment what would happen if someone stole the Mona Lisa. Well, once upon a time, someone did. On August 22, 1911, humiliated Louvre officials confessed to a disbelieving world that yes, the Mona Lisa had vanished. French authorities sealed the borders, searched every square foot of the museum's 49 acres, and inspected all outbound ships and trains. A young upstart artist named Pablo Picasso was among the many suspects questioned by police. But the search was fruitless. The Mona Lisa was gone. Newspapers of the day described the painting as Leonardo's masterpiece, or the most precious work of art in the world. It had not yet achieved global fame. The Mona Lisa's rise to stardom can be traced at least back to 1550, when an architect named Giorgio Vasari wrote the first biography of Leonardo. And Vasari waxed um, admiring of this portrait that, however, he never saw. So it had some reputation. The French king, Francois I, had acquired the painting from Leonardo around 1518. By the time Vasari was singing its praises three decades later, the Mona Lisa occupied a place of honor in the royal chateau of Fontainebleau. But there it was known as the portrait of an unnamed courtesan. It was the model's freely flowing hair that sullied her reputation. Mona Lisa had free hair, and free hair, normally in the, the Renaissance Florence, was reserved to young, uh, young ladies and prostitutes. And so one can't help feeling that there was kind of negative connotations, to put it kind of mildly, to her hairstyle. Louis XIV reportedly loved the work and brought it with him to Versailles. Louis XV hated the painting and had it expelled from the palace. Mona Lisa sat out the French Revolution, hidden in a warehouse. Except for a year with Napoleon and Josephine in the Tuileries Palace, the Mona Lisa remained at the Louvre from 1797 until she was stolen in 1911. Curators feared the painting might suffer damage outside the museum. A four inch long split ran from the edge of the panel to Mona Lisa's head. Further cracking could slice through her face and smile. More than two years after the theft, in November of 1913, an art dealer named Alfredo Jerry received a letter from someone claiming to have the Mona Lisa. The message was signed, Leonard. Jerry arranged a meeting at the Hotel Tripoli in Florence. He watched in amazement as Leonard lifted the Mona Lisa from beneath the false bottom of a trunk. 
After his arrest, Leonard was revealed to be Vincenzo Perugia. He claimed that patriotism was his motive for the theft. We thought that was a, a too important painting to be kept, to be kept in, uh, in France, that uh, this painting had to come back to Italy. Perugia had briefly worked at the Louvre, and his insider's knowledge allowed him to plan a successful heist. Once La Giaconda was in his possession, Perugia kept it under a stove at his home, less than a mile from the Louvre. Following his arrest, Perugia showed authorities how he smuggled Mona out of the museum. After the recovery, it was a well-guarded Mona Lisa that appeared briefly in Florence, Rome, and Milan. Then, she was sent home to France. Mona Lisa arrived in Paris on December 31, 1913. Roughly 100,000 visitors came to see her when the exhibit reopened on January 4th. The dramatic circumstances of her kidnapping and release transformed the Mona Lisa into an international pop icon. A status she enjoys to this day. Behind the scenes, Curators were relieved to find that Leonardo's masterpiece was undamaged despite two years without their professional care. Some credit for this resilience belongs to the anonymous restorer, who decades before made a pair of braces to stabilize the split. Because of their shape, they are known as butterfly braces. One of the two braces fell out during the early 1900s. Some historians believe it was lost when the Mona Lisa was stolen in 1911. Some 40 years later, the painting would be targeted again. Shortly before closing time on December 30th, 1956, a man stepped in front of the Mona Lisa and hurled a rock. It shattered the protective glass, gouged a divot of paint from her elbow, and revealed the gesso underneath. The vandalism provided curators with an opportunity they could never give themselves, a chance to study how the panel had been prepared. The ground was a millimeter thick, twice what is typical for oil painting. It was, however, the ideal depth for gilding with thin sheets of hammered gold. Religious paintings luminous with gold were the mainstay of medieval art. Though the art of gilding was known as far back as ancient Egypt, the process had changed little by medieval and renaissance times. Gold with methodical hammering can become impossibly thin and still hold together. Medieval artisans beat the metal down to a few millionths of an inch. A mix of red clay, water and glue known as bowl is used to adhere the gold leaf to the gesso ground. Rubbing the finished surface with a special burnishing tool makes the painting shine, though it is actually the clay, not the gold, that takes the polish. Today's burnishing tools are usually tipped with agate, though in ancient times, artists used a variety of materials, including dog's teeth. Many artists emboss the gold leaf with decorative patterns. A thick gesso ground was pliant enough to allow the layer of gold to be stamped without tearing. Artists abandoned gold leaf during the Renaissance, and subsequently panels were prepared with thinner layers of gesso. The Mona Lisa's thick ground may be a relic of medieval religious painting. After their brief tour of the Mona Lisa's gesso layer, Louvre curators repaired the painting and returned it to the gallery. The scar is still visible even to the naked eye. The more recent Louvre testing revealed that the painting had a few hidden scars as well. Under normal light, the patch of sky just to the left of Mona Lisa's forehead looks slightly lighter than adjacent areas. A process called ultraviolet fluorescence revealed a different picture. Early retouching had dissolved the varnish on the paint surface. As a result, Leonardo's original lapis lazuli blue sky peeks through. The high-tech exam also provided a new look at Mona Lisa's old hairdo. This view shows the familiar informal style. With the additional details provided by infrared filtering, we can see that just a few tendrils of Mona Lisa's hair were actually unbound. The style was common at the time, dispelling the myth that Mona was less than virtuous.
By the end of the exhaustive examination, Mona Lisa had yielded up a few of her secrets. More importantly, she emerged with a clean bill of health. The 3D image created by Canada's National Research Council provided curators with new tools for preserving the 500-year-old painting. It revealed the extent to which the panel was warped by cutting a virtual cross-section of the painting. In the future, a picture frame could be custom-made to precisely fit the panel's unique shape. La Gioconda needs to watch her temperature and humidity. Yet if she is diligent, there is every reason to believe she will live forever. But that still may not be time enough to figure out the ultimate Mona Lisa mystery, the meaning of her haunting smile. Only a handful of the planet's most revered shrines and holy places attract as many pilgrims as the Mona Lisa. On an average day, up to 26,000 visitors might file past her famous smile. What exactly do they hope to find? When you look at the Mona Lisa, you are seeing the face of a young woman, but more than that, you're seeing years of work of an individual. You're seeing his focus, his passion, his intensity. The mystery is maybe more about Leonardo than it is about Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa's knowing look seems to hint at wisdom, even answers. Now those answers may be within reach. Computer software that decodes expressions like a prism deciphers light reports La Gioconda shows a mix of four different emotions. The shape of the eye, the nose, the mouth are fairly similar, also the relative location. The, the Professor Thomas Wong is a leader in the field of emotion recognition technology. That is, software that interprets human expressions. Wong drew on research, identifying 12 signposts of emotion on the human face. Four at the corners of the mouth, plus two each at the eyebrows, eyelids, cheeks, and lips. He designed an algorithm, a set of precise computer commands, to track the movement of these 12 points on a fixed grid. From these movements, the algorithm calculates the level of six universal emotions. Anger, joy, disgust, sadness, fear, and surprise. The program can also work on static images. In Amsterdam, one of Dr. Wong's collaborators used this software to scan the Mona Lisa and compute her emotional profile. Wong replicated the experiment for our cameras. I was very much surprised and intrigued by the results. I expected to see happiness, but it's 83% happy, 9% disgust, and 6% uh, fear. So this little bit of disgust and fear may make this smile enigmatic, but this is just a conjecture. Dr. Wong also used this software to calculate the emotional profile of this man. Now we apply also this algorithm to a self-portrait of uh, Leonardo. So in this case, the two dominant emotions are sadness, which is about 76%, and uh, angry, which is about 24%. As far as we know, Leonardo made this one grumpy drawing of himself, placed alongside the Mona Lisa. They make a curious pair. Dr. Lillian Schwartz, a pioneer of computer graphics, proposed that more links the two than meets the eye. Using computers to process the images, Dr. Schwartz and a colleague flopped Leonardo, so he faced the same direction as his subject. Schwartz bisected each picture, scaled the two half images to an equal height, and electronically merged them. Dr. Schwartz saw that every feature, nose, mouth, chin, eyes, and hairline, matched exactly. She proposed a theory still resisted by some in the art world. Leonardo had infused the Mona Lisa with his own features. <laughs> Professor Wong agreed to run some additional experiments to test this theory. One of Wong's students developed a program that can import visual information from a flat picture and use it to shape a 3D model. For example, using the program, they gave this virtual 3D face the features of Mona Lisa. 
These slider switches allow an operator to adjust the 12 points that reveal emotions. Dr. Wong and his team call this process facial expression synthesis. Slowly putting in the anger and then putting in the sadness. Here is Mona Lisa, synthesized with Leonardo's emotional profile. 76% sad, 24% angry. We replicated Lillian Schwartz's experiment using Leonardo and his Mona Lisa emotional twin. This is the result. The revised composite image seems to confirm Schwartz's original thesis. We wanted to try one more test, so we enlisted Dr. Wong and his team to run another of their programs. We have an algorithm for recognizing gender of a person, and we apply it to Leonardo and apply it to Mona Lisa and see what the results are. A camera feeds the picture of a face into the computer. If the algorithm detects a male, as it does with this student, it superimposes a blue square on the face. Jason is apparently male. A red square indicates a female. It seems quite confident that Mona Lisa is female and uh, uh, Leonardo is male, which tend to favor the statement that Mona Lisa is not a self-portrait of Leonardo. While interesting and entertaining, None of this does anything to explain Mona Lisa's satisfied smile. The meaning of her expression always seems tantalized ever indecipherable, not unlike the landscape that frames it. The balcony immediately behind the figure is ordinary. It might be seen anywhere in Florence. But beyond Mona Lisa's balcony lies a strange and primitive world. Similar untamed landscapes appear in a handful of Leonardo's other works. This vision of a wild kind of primordial landscape seems to have had deep personal resonances for Leonardo because he used it so often and because it resembles nothing of the land in Italy or perhaps anywhere. It's a representation of how the world was created with all its forces. You have uh, many peaks, many, uh, many lakes, great, sort of great seas, vast mountains, uh, countryside, which can't be seen in, uh, in Florence. When Elisa had in that countryside in front of a uh, window, it's, not, uh, it's impossible. During the years Leonardo was painting the Mona Lisa, he was also nearing the height of his anatomical studies. Leonardo made what is likely one of the first drawings of a human embryo. He came to an understanding medical science wouldn't discover for centuries. The mother's seed has an influence on the embryo equal to that of the father's. Leonardo may have seen in the young mother sitting before him the embodiment of life's greatest mystery, the beginning of life. The forces of creation echo through the landscape behind her. And they're both instances of the procreative power of all living things, the interconnection of all life. Leonardo was far ahead of his time in understanding the bigger universe as well. A sentence in one of his many notebooks simply states, the sun doesn't move. This was decades before Copernicus made history by challenging the church's long-held belief that the sun revolves around the earth. It is entirely likely that Leonardo understood the world better than many of us do today. And that may well be the real secret of the Mona Lisa. In the end, no amount of science, no amount of analysis, and no amount of scholarship can fully explain what makes a masterpiece. Perhaps the powerful spell cast by the Mona Lisa and her smile lies not in the painting, but in the genius of its creator. There is nothing unique in Leonardo's painting except the hand of Leonardo. Not the materials, not the surface it's painted on, not the pigments, the binders, or even the tool that was used to apply the paint. It's Leonardo himself. <laughs>